I, Samurai, the brand new Netflix original anime, which was more than just a great anime, but was actually an amazing show in general, and I have been having a blast with this series, and it's really sad now, and even kind of emotional, that we are about to talk about the very last episode of season one, although it has been renewed for a second season, this has been a great four weeks, and I really enjoyed following these characters, Mitsu, Ringo, um, uh, Akemi, Taigen, Saki, and Swordfather, and all these great characters uh, aligned this great journey, uh, which we started here on the channel four weeks ago, uh, but it's time to wrap it up and move on. We are here now with a new year, with hopefully some more new animes and great movies and television shows to talk about, so let's come together and talk about this final season finale. So hello everyone and welcome to All Things Watched. In this video we are going to talk about episode so 8 of the Blue Eye Samurai, which was titled The Great Fire of 1657. So this episode actually begins with a flashback of Mitsu. And we see Mitsu as a child, and the child here is basically talking to his mother or uh, or someone who he believes is, uh, or yeah, he's talking to his mother, and of course, um, you know, he's basically telling her that he is going to get revenge, and all these people who ended up hurting her, uh, and you know, end up hurting both of them, and that uh, you know, he's really, you know, he's he's just on this path of chaos, and he will do whatever it takes to get revenge and also avenge his family and uh, and uh, you know her family and herself and then they have a great transition then uh, it then transitions into Mitsu, uh, Mizu in the uh, in the present day of course uh, with Ringo and she basically tells Ringo that she has that Ringo has to stay here and wait because she is going to go down and she is just going to wreak havoc hopefully wreak havoc uh, and really get her revenge on the second white devil remember there's four but she, she's only going to really encounter two in this season uh so we, there's undoubtedly there will be at least one in the next season uh it'd be interesting to see if if the last two are in the next season or if it's only going to be one uh it's hard to know uh, so, but anyways, she tells Ringo the plan, stay here, she's going to go in and see if she can rescue Akemi and get Akemi out, but ultimately she's not really there, I don't think, for Akemi, she's just here to uh, basically rage war on uh, Fowler, so then uh, the scene then actually goes and cuts to Fowler, and he's here now with the Shogun's children, of course, one of these children stutters, and he's actually... Uh, very mean to this person. He literally makes fun of the child, uh, the, the son that stutters. But he goes in and he has all of this gold, and he basically asks the both of them, why can't I actually come face to face with the actual Shogun? Because he's been doing this for such a long time, but he never really gets act actually up close and personal with the Shogun. It's like the Shogun never actually shows up to actually, you know, meet him face to face. And this sort of irritates him, but I think the Shogun probably doesn't trust him, and rightfully so, because he's clearly here to basically take over the territory and basically do whatever he like, uh, you know, over here in Japan with all this new weaponry and all the good stuff so he pays his dues he gives the gold uh, and like I said he does make fun of the child with the stutter which actually embarrasses the child uh, and so one thing I have to give credit to Netflix with and of course the voice actors as well and all the characteristics uh, of this character Fowler or what I've been calling the white devil um, is actually they do a really good job at making him <clears throat> excuse me making him a villain he is very hateable like this whole episode I'm just like please hurry up and let me through find him and turn him into a shish kebab because he's just such a ruthless unlikable character that uh, you know you gotta really uh, tip you know tip your hat to Netflix for really making us hate this character uh, but we find out in this episode according to him the other two characters are even worse he says that the two characters that we've already met uh, this guy and the guy that was a part of the four fangs were actually the better of the two of the four they were the two better of the f of the four and that the other two are even worse so I find that hard to believe but anyways then we get a beautiful shot here of the Shogun and the Queen 
uh, which is the mother, which is very evil and very mean to Akemi. And so, uh, but because it's the wedding day, you can see that certain members of probably of different family members, probably different community members, are all presenting gifts just out of respect for the royal wedding and whatnot. Or at least that's what I would assume. And all that good stuff. And then, of course, uh, we finally get to the scene here where Mitsu is actually starting to slowly but surely infiltrate the town. She's here now. She's being very quiet, very stealthy, which I appreciate because it's only her. She's literally a one-man army here. Now, she doesn't really need backup. And I think she understands that if there's too many people involved, her plan will very likely not work. And so this is why, you know, Ringo is sort of waiting out on the outskirts of town. He's not actually going in with her because he's not trained enough he won't be enough and you know it'll be more harmful for him to be there plus it's a risk that she doesn't need to take and plus she doesn't really want to to you know put Ringo in that position anyways she doesn't want anything to happen to him so she comes in sneaking around doing whatever she can to find out information and to figure out where the uh, Fowler is and where he's going to attack specifically. She's just basically trying to learn the layout of the land, I think. And so then we come back to Akemi, and we learn that Akemi has been, is now being held in the dungeon by her father, because if you can remember, in the last episode, she finds out that her father is actually a traitor. He is actually in on the coup with Fowler and with Fowler's partner, uh, and so you know, it makes I think this makes um, Akemi feel even more alone and even more isolated because she already felt really alone and very trapped and really, you know, stuck in this lifestyle that she doesn't even really want. But then when she learns that her father is actually in on this coup, I think that makes her feel even worse because now even her own father is using her and playing her for the power and benefit of politics. And so she's down here but then we get the scene with Saki because Saki says you know what I don't care about the Shogun enough is enough Akemi you get to live whatever life you want and he actually comes in with the sword and actually raises the sword to the Shogun so we know that there's literally no way that he can walk away from this now and I don't mean that as in he's not going to survive I just mean that there's no way that he can pull a sword on somebody with this who, who is this high up in authority and then expect to get away with it you know he has no choice now but to run with Akemi and leave with Akemi because he can't stay here because they will absolutely kill him and probably charge him with treason and maybe even hang him uh, because of the fact that he pulled a weapon on someone of such high authority and so uh, we get this very now it's also important to remember as well that uh, the shogun uh, in the next scene here you see Akemi she takes the sword and holds the sword up to her father's neck and she looks at him and says I want you to remember that you are breathing and you are alive now because I am allowing it which is actually something that he said to her earlier in the episode he looked at her and told her basically that she should be thankful for the life that she has because the only reason why she has it and the only reason why she's even alive is because he allows it and so now you see that story and that conversation come full circle with Akemi now holding the knife to him herself and telling him, hey, you know, you're lucky that, uh, you know, uh, now you're only alive because I'm allowing it. So I really thought that that was a great, uh, great little story, just like a quick little story arc within the episode itself. Great character development from Akemi. It shows that she's not afraid to stand up for what she believes, but also she's not afraid to stand up to true power because there's no doubt that he is a very powerful man. And so she definitely took a big risk, you know, by doing this, not to mention the fact that, you know, this is her own family and, you know, in the Japanese culture, all that stuff is taken into consideration. You know, her family might look at this as, you know, uh, as uh, dishonoring, you know, as more than just the fact that she turned on her. Her family is also like a, an honor thing. You know, the whole culture of, of Japan is, you know, is respect and honor and, you know, that type of thing. And so now she's, you know, she's willing to disrespect her own family and dishonor her own family for the greater good. And so her and Saki finally leaves, but of course, just as they're about to, you know, actually leave, leave, they go through this uh, little wooden area, almost like, a, I guess you could say, almost like an archway or like a porchway type thing. They're just about to exit the building when all of these crazy guards end up coming and they actually, uh, you know, end up basically holding Saki and Akemi 
uh, you know by the blade they basically you know corner them and of course uh akemi has the blade and zaki has you know a blade and they're willing to fight their way out because at this point like i just said there's no good ending for them now if they stay here so they really have no choice but just like that in the nick of time mitsu ends up coming and rescuing them and <laughs> mitsu just comes in and cuts through all of these people as if it was butter as if they're butter and it was just so fun to see mitsu do this and this also really to some degree builds a great relationship between akemi and mitsu and a part of me wonders if this might actually manipulate Akemi a little bit in the future. Seeing that Mitsu is, uh, you know, this great powerful warrior, I don't know if Mitsu knows that she's a woman yet because, uh, well, then again, she might not. I'm not 100% sure who knows that Mitsu is a woman. But if Akemi finds out that she's a woman, then, you know, she might look at this as, as inspiration saying, wow, here's a woman with all this power because Akemi sort of goes on that trip by the end of this episode. She sort of wants to be something great. But we'll get into that later on. In the meantime, Ringo is here and he, he fights a couple of these guards, which was hilarious. He does this sort of spin move where he like hits somebody with a weapon and he's like, oh wow, that actually works. And then he tries to hit the other guy and it turns out that the other guy is actually Tygen and he's just undercover and he's infiltrating the base as well. Now this is where I knew right away that the story was going to, something bad was probably going to happen because if you can remember, Mitsu told Ringo not to move. He said, I want you need to stay here and wait and be ready for when we come and when we get out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because Ringo, like we said in previous episodes, will likely be the escape route. Ringo was basically always the escape route. And so now that he's ran into Tygen, Tygen is like, well, listen, Mitsu only cares about himself. Here's an opportunity for you to do something great. You can help the Shogun and help me deliver a message to the Shogun, which is, hey, your life is uh, in danger you really got to you know you, know, you got to actually take this serious and if you don't believe me at the very least look so to speak so he recruits Ringo and then they end up going over onto this rooftop where they're overlooking and I thought that this uh, overlooking the court sorry of the main entrance uh, to where the Shogun is <clears throat> excuse me and I really love this uh, back and forth that they have here this banter because it was so hilarious <laughs> because uh, you know Tygen basically looks at, or, or Ringo, I'm sorry, looks at Tygen, and, and and they're trying to figure out how to approach the gate, how to infiltrate it without, you know, causing too much trouble. Is there a stealthy way of doing it? Can they do it without, you know, by avoiding conflict? <laughs> and Ringo basically looks at Tygen, and Ringo's like, well, I wonder what Mitsu would do. And Tygen was like, well, he's so stupid, he'd probably just go right through the front gate. And they just look at each other. And I just thought that that was so clever and so funny because that's exactly what they do. They actually do what they think Mitsu would do. Which also, by the way, that also shows how much respect they have for Mitsu because they actually try to think about what Mitsu would do. And then when they figure out what he would do or what she would do, <coughs> excuse me, what she would do, then they actually do it themselves, which shows that they actually trust Mitsu and they actually sort of trust the mentality or the planning or the bold and courageousness of Mitsu, which, um, you know, which re basically means that they really respect Mitsu enough to actually go forward with the plan. But anyways, they get in through the gate, but of course they get captured. I mean, you know, they I don't think they expected to not get captured. They are, you know, going up on the Shogun, pretty well the most powerful person in this territory. And of course, all the guards ends up arresting them. And he's trying to sing out to the Shogun, but they're simply not listening because, you know, they're being arrested and whatnot. So he's able to get a bow and arrow and he shoots the arrow at the Shogun, but not in the sense that it actually hurts him, just so that he can get his attention. And of course, this does get the Shogun's attention. And, you know, then the Shogun basically calls them over. And Tygen tells him, I am a loyal samurai to this certain clan, this certain family. And that he is, uh, you know, basically... Uh, excuse me, and he's basically, you know, a protector of the Shogun, and he's not, he's an ally, not a bad guy, and he tells the Shogun that Fowler is coming along with the other dude, or, or along with a, a full army of these, uh, you know, Japanese warriors, but they're not going to be using swords, they're going to be using guns, and so he manages to finally get that warning across the Shogun. And I really thought that that was really clever because I, I thought it was really clever in the sense of the writing because of the fact that we knew that they, he, you know, these characters would never actually get close to the Shogun. They're just not a high enough authority. 
plus the reputation I would think is just not good enough to give them that kind of access so I really liked how they kind of work together Ringo you know throws the bow and arrow at Tigan and is like here shoot this and get his attention and they do and it actually works and so the Shogun ends up basically whistling up to the guard who's up in the tower and tells him to take a look and he do he takes out the scope which you would see uh, almost like people on ships and boats almost like a pirate type thing you know and he pulls out the scope and uh, he looks around and of course sure enough he sees this huge army coming and he sees Fowler right in the front and they have all the emblem and the symbol which is like a half moon symbol so to speak uh, of this army you know basically it's, it's just their emblem of the clan that he's basically arriving with because remember he killed uh, the, the leader of that clan in the previous episode so now he's taking control of this army and he's uh, equipped them all with these guns but not with samurai swords so it's not going to be really all that much of a fight because the samurai are just simply not going to be able to stand up to the guns uh, but the and so uh, and so Fowler matches on and then of course exactly what we said happens the samurais come out and also the archers the bow and arrows they all come out uh, to meet uh, Fowler and his army but the army just opens fire with their guns and the samurai and the archers are literally no match in fact they're not even in the same category they can't even you know the bow and arrows can't even go far enough to hit the army whereas the bullets can and so Fowler comes in and just wipes out basically everybody literally in the front gate and it's just a bloodbath as you can see they all get killed very quickly and then you can see in this image that uh, even the bow and arrows, even the archers, are not able to get their bow and arrows to go far enough to the point where they could actually hit uh, Fowler or any of his army. So remember, Fowler is very intelligent. The White Devil is extremely smart. And, uh, and you know, so he knew right where to stop. He knew where to line up his army. And he knew for them not to go any further and not to proceed. And honestly, this was a little bit hard to watch because, you know, we're, you're rooting for the samurai. You want the Japanese culture to win. You want them to stand against this, you know, uh, you know, this rebellion, which really came from uh, Europe. Uh, I believe he says London, which I think would be London, England. And so that's where he ended up uh, coming from. And then he brought the guns with him. And so it was just really hard to watch and see this culture uh, or see so many people in this culture get hurt. Uh, because they couldn't stand up to the guns so then of course this uh, his Japanese partner who was already inside and close to the Shogun he does he you know he's just like Fowler he's a coward even later on in the episode we get a great example of how much of a coward he is and so he hauls at the pistols and uh, he actually has a couple of pistols so I'm guessing uh, the White Devil uh, gave him a couple just so that he wouldn't have to reload I guess and so he shoots all the guards and he opens the door allowing Fowler to come in so now Fowler is making his way basically right into the Shogun and this scene is just absolutely brutal but before he does anything too crazy he actually sees Tigan and he's like hey didn't I kill you already <laughs> so it was just really cool just a little funny back and forth uh, between him and Tigan uh, but then here you can see in this scene you know, I'm not going to show anything crazy here because, you know, I've got to keep a PG here on, on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, but as you can see, he just literally, he picks them off just like that. Uh, and he knows that if he kills certain people like this, especially the warriors, especially the leaders, especially people like the Shogun, then this becomes a very humiliating uh, death. And so the humiliation, because the Japanese are so, you know, uh, you know, their reputations and respect and honor is so important to them in their culture that Fowler knows that this type of easy death you know basically the idea that you know this guy is able to just come in and just take over like that it's a very humiliating so this would damage his reputation so not only is he slaughtering a group of people but he's also destroying their family names as well and it becomes very humiliating uh, and then of course he ends up pointing the gun at uh, at Tigan and just as he pulls the trigger as you can see in the background Mitsu comes flying through the window and he's and uh, she's able to hit the trigger which actually blows up right in front of Fowler's face because I think it sparks when her uh, sword ends up hitting his gun it ca creates a bunch of sparks and it blows up in his face uh, now it doesn't really do too much damage to him it leaves like a little bruise or something like that it's nothing uh, too too crazy 
but it was still really good. Uh, it was still really cool to see uh, to see Mitsu get there just in time. And she falls down, uh, you know, basically flat on her back. And Tygen basically, you know, Tygen is in like, uh, you know, Tygen doesn't waste any time. He's just telling everybody, you know, everybody, we need to attack right now because he knows that, you know, he jumps on this opportunity. And so he starts attacking. Mitsu starts attacking, and Mitsu has a really cool scene. Uh, as well with the uh, with the bullet time, as you can see, the bullet uh, you know, coming, you know, is basically like the Matrix. And then she just goes full blown assault, and she literally just <laughs> basically kills everybody in that room, which was so satisfying to watch. And so then finally, Tigan ends up getting the, uh, the the Japanese leader that ended up betraying the Shogun, uh, basically Fowler or the White Devil's main Japanese uh, uh, partner, the one that uh, Mitsu cut his hand off all the way back in episode 3, I think it was, when when they, he had his giant uh, invite Taigen and Mitsu to his place, and they had some green tea. Remember, uh, uh, Mitsu fought that giant in the previous episode? Well, now, the same guy finally comes to, uh, gets what he deserves, gets his justice by Taigen, and it is not a uh, instant death, it's a very brutal death. Uh, Taigen literally puts that sword right down through his entire body, because he basically looks at him and says, listen, you're going to die by the sword, uh, because, you know, a lot of the other people were shot and actually killed by being shot in the head, while well, basically Taigen's like, you're not going to get off that easy. I'm going to put my sword right down through your body, and that's exactly what he does. And then we get this awesome, just sick showdown between Taigen and uh, Mitsu, and of course, the White Devil, or Fowler. The only thing that I would have to say that I was not a huge fan about this part of the episode, and this is only a small nitpick, and I don't mean that as in I didn't like the episode, I just mean this was a little bit unrealistic for me, even within this world that it built, is I just can't see this guy being able to take on both Mitsu and Taigen, so I didn't really buy into that. But anyways, it was a great action sequence, and of course uh, Taigen ends up getting pretty beat up again. Now, let's not forget Taigen is probably not at, not 100% either. He's still recovering from uh, you know all of his previous injuries, so I guess I should take that into consideration. Uh, but what I really like liked here was that when Taigen ends up falling, Mitsu tells him to stay down and live, and then she goes after him, and she keeps chasing Fowler all around to the point where he just keeps running away, because remember, he's a coward, that's why he uses a gun, uh, because he's no good with swords, he can't fight against an actual samurai, and so Mitsu ends up catching everything on fire, and basically corners him, and then basically uh, makes it so that he can't escape. And just look how cool she looks here. Like, this is her now, you know, about to get her revenge. Uh, now, in the meantime, Saki and Akemi are trying to escape. And they go across this bridge that has these two massive wooden doors blocking everybody from being able to get out. But unfortunately, one person is able to stick their gun out through the door and get a shot off, which ends up killing Saki. Which is actually really sad because, you know, Saki was the only person that Akemi truly had through consistently throughout the entire series and always had her back even here now you know he, she uh, he helped her escape from her father and all that kind of stuff so this was a really emotional scene and it was really sad to see uh, to see Akemi have to lose Saki just like this and of course then uh, Taigen ends up finding uh, Akemi and they have this really beautiful moment where you think that one thing is going to happen uh, but then something else completely different ends up happening because Tygen ends up telling her, listen, we're together now, let's just go and be in love. And Tygen says, I don't need to be great, I just want to be happy. And I think that was such a, a beautiful moment for Tygen. Remember, at the beginning of this series, Tygen was all like, oh, I'm going to kill Mitsu, I'm going to get my honor back. And now, by the end of the series, Tygen is like, I don't even care about any of that now, I just want to be happy. But unfortunately, Akemi has now taken the opposite route because Akemi used to be like that. She did not want to be, you know, anything special. And then she looks at Taigen and says, well, I don't want that. She says, I want to be great. And I think that this is actually setting Akemi to be the villain in season two. But we'll get there uh, at the end when we make a couple of predictions and stuff uh, at the end of the review. In the meantime, Mitsu and Fowler has just an absolute brutal back and forth. Mitsu ends up like just 
constantly kneeing him right in the face, and it's so satisfying to see it, and, and to see him get his butt handed to him by Mitsu, and just as she is about to kill him, she holds him up against the wall, and he basically, you know, tells her, stop, wait, you can't kill me, uh, because uh, I have a bunch of information, and this and and a part of me thinks that he's probably telling the truth here uh, but he tells Mitsu about the other two white devils and he tells her that that uh, one of them's name I think he said is Skiffington or Skiffington Skiffington and he says that uh, Skiffington is located actually over in London and so if Mitsu wants to be able to get to him she's going to have to travel to Europe and go to London and actually kill him over there and he also tells her that her mother is not actually dead excuse me because her mother is actually still alive and you know this whole time we were assuming that uh, you know that um, we were just assuming that her father was you know one of the four white devils but imagine what kind of twist it would be if her father was actually japanese and her mother was white like how crazy would that be i don't think they'll go that route because they focus so much on and you know her father being white but just imagine how crazy it would be if they end up swapping uh, uh, swapping it out and we learn in season two that it was actually her mother that was the white person and her father was actually uh you know japanese It'd be crazy if it turned out that her father was actually sword father but i don't think it will happen like that but either way it'd be pretty cool because we really don't know anything about mitsu's past now because all we know is that everything she thinks she knew was a lie and so we end up getting this beautiful panned out shot here of the country and everything's just on fire and burning uh, because of the conflict that went on between the shogun and uh and fowler and that whole war that just happened but i just wanted to take a screenshot of it because it looks so good it looked like a really good uh, really nice shot and then, of course, as we approach the end of the episode, uh, Ringo ends up returning to Swordfather, <clears throat> excuse me, and tells him that Mitsu did not return, and he said that he waited, and, uh, but, you know, obviously he had to leave eventually, and Swordfather basically tells him, well, you cannot wait forever. So I'm thinking now that moving ahead in Season 2, Ringo will continue to train and maybe even learn how to make weapons under Swordfather, which will be very similar to the kind of training that Mitsu had. But we'll get into that in a few minutes. And then for the very final shots of this episode, we see uh, Fowler, or White Devil number 2. He's still very much alive, and he's in this prison. <coughs> Excuse me. And we learn that Mitsu actually has him... Uh, on a boat and on a ship which by the way check out that animation it looks great she looks absolutely awesome the boat the water the sky all looks quite very amazing with the animation and it turns out that she is actually literally on her way to Europe to find the other two or specifically to find Skiffington and that is how the episode ends what a beautiful shot to end it on what a beautiful uh, amount of scenery and and that's basically it in terms of the scene by scene parts of the episode so <clears throat> overall I really did like the episode but I did think it was a little anticlimactic I do wish that there was a little bit more justice to Fowler uh, because he just played such a good villain we just hated him so much that I was really looking forward to Mitsu just going in and ripping him apart I do wish that the choreography and the fight sequences had been a little bit more like episode 6 I think episode 6 was the standout that was the best uh, action that the whole series had it had the, uh, the best choreography, the best score, sounds, music, and just really get you pumped. The whole episode was just like an all-out war with her infiltrating that building, so it was really nice to see that. Uh, but at the same time, I understand an animation takes a long time. You know, it's easier said than done. So I just appreciate that we did have at least one episode where she went uh, ballistic, and that was episode 6. So I did feel like it was a little anticlimactic, but at the same time, I do know that now we do know that season two is coming. And so here's my predict predictions real quick about the future. Um, I do think that we're going to see Skiffington in season two, and I do think that they will be, the other two will actually be worse than the two that we've already met. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have no doubts in my mind that they'll be worse. I even have a feeling as well that even Mitsu's mother will be even worse again. I think she will be despicable. I think we're going to hate her. I think Mitsu's going to hate her. 
Um, I think that Akemi is going to become the bad guy over in Japan, and I think that they did a really good job with the way that they ended uh, Mitsu's story, because Mitsu is no longer in Japan now, but I have no doubts that eventually she's going to have to return. I feel like when Mitsu returns, which will likely be a season 3, uh, or at the very at least the latter uh, end of season 2, when she comes back, Akemi will already be uh, in power. I think Akemi will be the bad guy if season two in Japan, I mean. And then I think that uh, Taigen will see this and will not want to go along with it. So this sort of opens the door for Mitsu and Taigen to maybe get together in the future or at the very least stick together. Maybe they won't get together romantically. But I do think that Akemi's quest for power will turn Taigen off. And I do think that um, I do think that at some point Mitsu and Akemi will probably have it out maybe uh, it's hard to know because Mitsu did save her but at the same time I do think that um I do think that the quest of power will make her you know maybe even more formidable than the white devils so it'd be very interesting but I have no dates in my mind that Akemi is being set up as a villain I definitely think that Taigen is going to uh, go away maybe go back to the sword father with Ringo or maybe even chase uh, Mitsu, or maybe even maybe he'll even spend all of season two looking for Mitsu, but he won't find her because she's over in Europe. So, either way, I do think Akemi will be the the bad guy. I think in terms of Mitsu's story, she's going to go over there, and I have a feeling that she's probably going to get in a lot of trouble. She's not used to that way of life. She's going to be, she, you know, she's going to really struggle blending in. And I do think that she's going to have a lot of trouble with Skiffington. I don't think it's going to be as easy or, you know, as simple as just walking in and getting him. I do think that the rules and the law is going to be very different over in Europe compared to Japan. We also need to remember that uh, England and over in London, they already have all these weapons, these guns. So even the infantry is going to be very different. So I have no doubts in my mind that she's going to get in a lot of trouble over at England. And I think, uh, and as for Ringo, I think Ringo is just going to hang it with Swordfather, uh, you know, until, and actually train until he's reunited with either Taigen or Mitsu or, well, especially Mitsu. I do think that he'll see Taigen again, but uh, I have a feeling Taigen might even help him training in his training as well and all that good stuff. But uh, either way, that's what I think is going to happen in the next season. Can't wait to see season two. It has been confirmed. There definitely will be a season two. And I can't wait to see all these characters moving forward. In terms of the first season, I absolutely loved it. I really liked this episode. Uh, I will do just uh, just a review, uh, just a, a review of the whole season separately uh, and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty well all I got. So let me know in the comment section below if you like the finale of this season and uh, and if you liked episode eight. Uh, if you like this video, click that subscribe button. And until the next one, take care.